Hey Inspired Moneymaker, today we're going to find out what it's like living with no debt in no credit score. Episode 229 features Steve Stewart, professional podcast editor and 100% debt free. I was able to check and see if I had a credit score a couple times, but there was no reason to check for a credit score because I wasn't planning on borrowing money. Uh, you're going to hear over and over the mantra is you need to have a good credit score or you need to have a great credit score. You don't. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. When was the last time that you swiped your credit card? Tapping counts too. Do you have a mortgage, student loans, or any other debt? Today's guest is Steve Stewart. Not only is he debt free, but he cut up all his credit cards in 2007. He's the editor of popular personal finance podcasts, including The Stacking Benjamins Show, Afford Anything, Choose FI, and Financial Grown Up, just to name a few. Steve says living without a credit score is not for everyone, but for his family, it aligns with their belief system and makes them happy. In a world where it's tempting to be keeping up with the Joneses, I think it's very cool to see money and credit from a different angle. It's okay to do things differently than most. In this episode, you'll learn tips for accelerating debt payoff, the difference between a credit score and credit worthiness. And make sure to tune in through the end to hear how Steve's podcast editing side hustle allowed him to leave his corporate job. Before we start, Steve also shares tips on being consistent with your budget. He's a fan of the YNAB app, that stands for You Need a Budget. I know a lot of people who give it rave reviews. If you want to try YNAB and get a free trial, I'm going to leave an affiliate link in the comments. Now let's get inspired with Steve Stewart. Steve, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? I don't have a great memory, especially the younger years, but I, I imagine it had to do something with candy and going to the local, you know, a place called the the Party Pantry. And it was just a little convenience store, not even as big as a 7-Eleven. And I just think I remember that. But actually, the the most, I think, impactful money lesson that I can remember going back would be when I first learned about how to earn money and actually got a paper out. I think I got a paper out when I was like 10. Started throwing, you know, you had to get up early in the morning, roll up the papers, put them in a plastic bag, throw them on the porch. I don't even know if people know what that's like anymore. Do we still do that? I don't know. But it was a way to earn money. And that was really cool to be able to say I did work and I earned money. And here it came in the form of a check. What's a check? You know, at 10 years old, you got to learn about all that stuff. So I would say that would be my earliest, um, earliest memories. Oh, that's a great one. Paper route, I think, taught you many skills. You, you, right? As an entrepreneur, you had to do a little bit of everything, in, including waking up early, that kind of discipline. Yep. That was a, definitely a time management thing because you had to get it done before school. <laughs> so Steve, I'm excited to have you on the show. You've definitely um, helped me sort of launching a podcast and getting off on the right foot. You've inspired many people in this space. And I think that you're a good example that you can't judge a book by its cover because you were once an internal auditor for a restaurant company. It all sounds very traditional. Like I look mm -hmm. at you, I don't see tattoos all over or piercings, but as I get to know you, as I've gotten to know you and you, peer, you, you peel the layers back, you're, you're kind of like this counter-cultural guy who does things like, Give us some examples so that we can just get to know you outside of the financial stuff. Do you have any examples of things where you buck, uh, buck convention? Yeah, absolutely. And it had to do with how I got to be where I am today, editing podcasts for personal finance podcasters like yourself. Uh, I don't want to go through the whole story of how I got there, but let's just start with uh, 2003 or four. I was driving to do that job. I was driving a lot through like Southern Illinois Tennessee, Kentucky, um, Wisconsin, it was ridiculous, just driving a lot of hours. And I bumped on, uh, I was bumping around the, the, the FM band on the radio and I bumped into Dave Ramsey and became a fan. So I started learning about personal finance, realized that 
my wife and I thought we were doing good with money and we found out we were just average and we could definitely do a lot better. Kind of turned our lives around financially that way and started a financial blog in 2007. And that's where I really got into the whole, okay, how does this money thing really work? And uh, because I'm a Christian, how does the Bible tie into it? And that really was the, the, the thing that solidified in my beliefs in this counterculture piece that I'm going to bring up, which is all about credit scores. The credit score thing and credit cards, it's, well, the credit cards is definitely against my religion. We can go into that deeply if you want to, uh, but that's where it gets to be countercultural because I'm very anti credit cards. I won't impose that belief on other people, but if they want to learn more, they can definitely ask me questions and I'll give them my reasons for why that is. Okay. I do want to get into that before that. Can you just give us a kind of timeline of your debt-free journey? You mentioned yeah. listening to Dave Ramsey. So I'm assuming that that's where it kicked off, but you yeah. bought a house, I think in 1999. So just give us a quick timeline. How'd you know about the house in 99? Boy, <laughs> you really did your research. Yeah, we bought a house. Okay. So my wife and I met in 97, we got married in 2000 and bought the house moved into it, had the child a year later. It was like, boom, 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 doing the average thing. Wife had a 401k, I had a 401k. We had, you know, manageable, you know, car loans. Obviously we had the mortgage and there were a couple of times where I missed, you know, making the payment on the credit card, stupid me. Uh, but I thought, okay, that's average. That's great. And that was 2003, just a few years later that I bumped into Dave Ramsey, really started digging into personal finance. So we had a savings gene, we had a spending uh, pattern that wasn't you know, outrageous and crazy, but we weren't doing better than average, which we should have been able to do. Good incomes, solid family life, uh, solid jobs, things like that. It was 2006, I'm like, okay, we're doing this pretty good, but oh, you know, I'm keeping my credit card. Uh, we, you know, my wife wanted a new Jeep and I'm like, okay, well, we don't have enough save to buy a new Jeep. So we'll, we've got the trade in, we've got a good chunk of money, but we can't do it all. So we had to borrow $12,000 to buy this Jeep in 2006. And I'm like, we could do better than this. This is ridiculous. So that was when I personally, I was like, that's it. No more. I'm done. I cut up the credit cards. I'm like, I'm not borrowing any more money. This is it. We paid that thing off in 2007. So 13 months later, that car was paid off. Haven't had a debt in the world since then, except for our mortgage. That mortgage, by the way, <laughs> thinking, oh, we're going to do well here. We got a mortgage 2000 and it was a, a three-year arm, a three-year arm, which, or a five-year arm. I'm sorry. It's a five-year arm, which I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, basically- so an adjustable we had a, rate mortgage. Yeah. Yeah. Adjustable rate meaning after about five years, things would change. How would we know if the payment would go up or not? Oh, you could just refinance later. Don't worry about it. How do we know if the rates were going to go up or down? We didn't know. So we ended up in 2003 refinancing that loan to a 15 year fixed. And then we actually paid it off early in 2015. And so we're, we're debt free since 2015, uh, no car, no debt with the mortgage, no credit cards, no family loans, no student loans. Thank goodness, man. Congrats on yeah. paying both mortgage and the car loan off early. What are your tips for ways to accelerate paying that down? Obviously uh, paying attention to what you're doing. I have a motto called paid attention. I have a motto, it's called pay attention, not interest. I believe if you pay attention to something, like if you're paying attention to your relationship, you're gonna have great relationships. If you pay attention to your career, you're gonna have a better career. If you pay attention to your money, you're gonna do better with money. And that's what I did was we spent more time looking at what we're doing with our money, budgeting, spending, saving, investing. We spent more time on that than just watching television shows, you know? So it was those types of things that caused me to be able to take what we had and be more efficient with it. So the, on, the money that we earned, we were able to put towards debt and pay it off so we weren't paying interest. We were able to put into savings so that if something were to happen, like a tire blowout, we'd be able to be able to make the repair, not have to go into debt. We would be able to start to invest more and more wisely. We had the 401ks, but my wife had a 401k where she put money into two types of funds. One was like a, a match fund, it was dollar for dollar, that was it, which most people get anyway with a company match. And the other one was like this, this stable investment, which again, didn't grow very much. 
I was like, we could do better than this. Let's just look at these options and change the portfolio mix into something that even me, who wasn't really a specialist in this thing, we were able to get a much better return on her 401k in the uh, last you know decade or so just because of that change, all because we paid attention to the money situations. You've always been like a side hustle guy. How did that fit into, you know, trying to pay down more quicker? Oh, the side hustles? <laughs> uh, I think it's because I get bored with doing the same thing in a day job, really, especially a day job that kept me traveling a lot. I was on the road a lot where uh, on average, two nights a week, I'd be away in a hotel room or something. So why not do a side hustle? So 2007 was when I started a financial blog. I thought, well, I could become a financial coach. I started pursuing that that avenue and was hoping that would become a, a full-time career. And it really, what it got me involved in more was just in the personal finance community, which eventually paid off for me because now I'm a, a podcast editor for personal finance podcasters. The side hustle was the way just to keep myself busy and be productive at the same time. Because again, I'm not going to sit there watching TV just to waste time or, or to, to fill the day. I mean, oh, I just, I, I need to be productive and why not do something that helps other people and can help generate some extra income? Steve, how many side hustles do you think you've had over the years? That succeeded? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> well, one. No, I one. want to know the ones that failed and succeeded. <laughs> no, not a whole bunch of side hustles. I wouldn't say there's a bunch. I'm trying to think of all of them now. I should probably list them out. Uh, really, it was... It was um, Gosh, now you got me on the paper out thing that we were talking about earlier, but uh, the side hustles in the last decade or two were uh, trying to sell stuff online, uh, doing some uh, courses online as well. So it wasn't just selling physical products, but digital products as well. And even now, uh, when my full-time career is a podcast editor, uh, I have this side hustle of a membership site to help other podcast editors learn how to start and grow a business as an editor like myself. So even now, though the majority of my my income comes from this one job, I'm still trying to do some other things. Yeah, I guess you, you like to keep yourself challenged or busy doing different things other than watching TV. Yeah. You I'm sure one. if I had three DJing, or four. I, I understand yes. DJing played a pretty good part. Oh my gosh, you're right. I didn't, I didn't even think about it. For the people watching the video, you can see I've got a whole wall of records, vinyl records here. And these are 12-inch remix type records. Uh, yeah, gosh, why did I think about that? Started doing that when I was in uh, high school. When I was 18, I actually got to start working in nightclubs. Couldn't drink, thank goodness. Uh, but I could spin the records for those who did. And <laughs> I started doing uh, you know, weddings and parties and then got into corporate events. And boy, that was a good time. But it, it's hard work. I'll, I'll tell you, it's hard work. How many DJ gigs were you getting so that you could pay down the Jeep car loan? You know, much oh, quicker? Oh, right. Right. About that time, I had, I had somehow bumped into this guy who was able to book these really big, awesome corporate events. And I would go to, for instance, uh, Smyrna, Tennessee, there's a, a, a was a Saturn and Nissan plant, a Saturn plant. And I would go down there and uh, do their family picnic day, which we're talking about anywhere from five to 15,000 people. And that would pay a couple thousand dollars. Fantastic. When my wife and I decided to get out of debt, I was like, every dollar I make on this this DJ gig, I'm going to put towards the debt. So that's how in 13 months, I was able to pay down that that loan, not just in our normal monthly car payments and anything extra we might be able to throw at it, but the DJ gigs on the side. So that, that was just something that we did. Uh, that was the focus time, but that DJ gig did last, you know, years before and after as well. I, I couldn't tell you how much I made as a DJ, but some gigs paid well, some gigs didn't, and some gigs weren't worth the really great money that they were paying me for it either. So <laughs> it was a mishmash of, of great gigs and, and maybe not so great gigs. That's pretty cool when you can take whatever you earned, whether it was a thousand dollars or a few hundred dollars and put it all towards, towards your car loan or your bills. Because from what I understand, even if you're just paying like 10 extra dollars, even if you're just playing, you know, doing small, 
it makes a difference over time. Yeah. I had a spreadsheet for our mortgage because I was so excited about paying that off early someday that I created the spreadsheet and I could see what the amortization schedule was and what it could be if we paid extra down. So I'd throw some numbers in there and I'd look at the bottom of the page and say, okay, this is how much interest we would not end up paying if we paid an extra hundred bucks a month for six months. And this is how much sooner we'd be able to get out of debt. And that just kept me going. It's like, okay, I can see the white, you know, the, the cells would be color coded if there was something in it. But then when it was empty, when there was nothing there, it would turn white. And I was like, cool. I, I When you see the blank page just rising up on the spreadsheet, it kept you encouraged. It kept me encouraged on, uh, on you know, throwing every extra dollar we could at it and trying to find something in the budget that we could just automatically have more and more and more money thrown at the mortgage at the principal so we can get out of debt sooner. I love the visual. That's got to be helpful. And goes back to your auditor experience, I would imagine, creating the spreadsheet that you can check in on every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. So when you started going down this the debt-free journey, you know, based on Dave Ramsey, was your wife on board right away? Yeah. Yeah. She knew we should, we, she knew we, she knew we should be doing better with our money too. So, uh, I think she likes to spend money more than I do. Uh, so we still would do vacations. We would still do things, but this was a mutually agreed, uh, event that we would work on together to make sure that we weren't just not going back to my motto, pay attention, not interest. We paid attention to what we're doing to make sure that it wasn't going to harm something else. Uh, we replaced the windows in the house a couple years sooner than I wanted to. I wanted to take the money that we spent on the windows and throw it at the house. And we would have been out of, out of the debt probably a year sooner, but it was something that we talked about and like, yeah, it's time to replace the windows in the house. Both floors. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, it's interesting to look back and see how you prioritize. But yeah, I think sometimes you're using it. Like there's a benefit to replacing the windows. You're also going to get fuel efficiency or uh, you know more efficient heating. So there are benefits. Talk a little bit about when and why you decided to stop using credit cards completely. It was the convincing of looking at scripture and understanding it that the borrower is slave to the lender that is a verse in the bible and it's like okay but credit cards yeah borrow because you actually are borrowing money even if it is a limited amount of time if you pay off your credit card every month it's still borrowing money for a limited amount of time and it's not like you're, you're like making an agreement with the uh utility company where you're saying okay we're going to use the energy and then pay it at the end of the month what you're doing is borrowing nothing you're borrowing the opportunity to get something in your hands sooner than if you were to have to save up and pay cash for it. And that's another thing that's in the Bible is, you know, those who, who rushed into anybody who rushes into trying to, you know, the get rich quick type things, it it's not good. There's always something on the end that just didn't, it doesn't work out. And I found that patience is a virtue that we should be using when we're talking about spending money and thinking it through, paying attention, not interest. So all these things just kind of coalesced together to where I was like, you know what? I don't need the credit cards. In fact, when, when I cut them up, I mean, I was mad in 2007 or 2006 when we got the, the car loan. I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I was mad and I cut up the cards. And I went for like six months and I was like, you know, I'm not missing them at all. And I felt that that was a really great feeling just to be able to, to not have to rely on something else. There were times where it was tight and we're like, okay, well, we just won't do this fill in the blank thing because we don't have the money. But then, you know, of course the side gig, that type, that kind of thing helps. Cause then it's like, okay, if we had to, you know, we've got the cash flow coming to where we could do something a little more if we had to, uh, that wasn't paying off debt, that, that, sh that foreshadowing of income is very helpful. Cash flow is also something that's very encouraging to know that you don't need credit cards. Cause if you've got money coming in from the day job, from side hustles or anything like that, then why would you need to spend money on a credit card? That just didn't make sense to me anymore. And the final argument that really bugs me because this is the thing that I don't hear anybody else talking about. When you think about credit card rewards, 
everything's just great. You know, it's good management of money, right? If you can use something, use a credit card and earn the rewards. Well, you got to think about where does the credit card company come up with the money for the rewards that they give you? It's coming off of the backs of people who are paying interest. It's coming from all the processing fees, which is inflating the cost of goods and services on the shelf. It's coming from, you know, overdraft fees. People are in trouble. And I couldn't do that as a financial coach. I was like, well, I'm, I'm saying, you know, don't use credit cards unless you're going to get rewards. And then you're going to steal from the poor and give to the rich. It doesn't make sense to me. I would much rather have a relationship with my local bank. And it's just a cash basis or cash equivalent basis, I guess I should say. Well, there's no debt transactions there. It's checking, it's savings, it could be investing, things like that. And it's not coming out of, you know, somebody else's pocket. It's it's coming from maybe a marketing budget if they're trying to get you to use their debit card or their services at the bank. But I do agree we need banks for services for certain things. I mean, there are times when we might need to get a mortgage for a house. I get that. Everything else, I just I couldn't I couldn't see a justifiable reason to use credit cards anymore. Debit, check cash and heck now crypto <laughs> yes so do you own any crypto will you own <laughs> any crypto i don't i should have got in way you know i think i started learning about crypto back in 2013 and i never got it got into it uh we'll see we'll see someday maybe but uh, i don't think i need it so i'm not going to complicate my life with it right now yeah i think that your 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 motivation that it was a belief system on, well, as it relates to borrowing money. Uh, that was a little bit unexpected because initially I figured you cut up credit cards because in your past you had a problem with running up the credit card bill. That wasn't the case. Right. Um, I feel like many people, they have a belief system. Oftentimes we don't think about how does that relate to our money? Uh, but it is important. Like, talk a little, like, can you elaborate a little bit more on, like, how, how that makes you feel? Well, the belief system I have really confirms my actions. And because it's been so, I don't want to say it's been easy. I don't want to say it's been easy. Life is definitely simpler. When you draw a line and you say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And you stick to that for a while, of course, over time, it's going to get easier. Just like somebody who, you know, gives up smoking, it's going to be hard for the first year or two, but then after all that, it just has become a habit. And it's the same with my credit card usage. I just stopped doing it. I stuck with it for a while. I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. That belief system forced my actions to stay the same. It kept me on the path, even though it could have been easy just to go back and say, you know what? It'd be nice to go on vacation. We don't have the money saved up for it now, so we're going to do this instead. We're going to use a credit card. It'd be easy to do that because A, it's socially acceptable and B, and kind of promoted within our, our culture. Oh, use a credit card, you know, go do the things. But the patience and the and postponing and the thinking about the things that you're doing with the money is so much more important to me because then you're also going to value what you do while you're there and not be distracted later by the, oh my gosh, I'm going to pay for this type thing. Uh, so the belief system just kind of fell in line with everything I was doing. It, it kind of saved me from myself. <laughs> so you say that you don't advocate this for everybody, but I think you are here to dispel the idea that one cannot live without credit cards in America, or even greater, one cannot live without a credit score because... Mm -hmm. How many years has it been since you've had no credit card? Your credit score, what does that look like? Does it exist? No, it doesn't exist. I don't have one. I, we paid off the mortgage, which was the last thing keeping my credit score alive, or at least at least a credit report. Um, yeah, I was getting, I was able to check and see if I had a credit score a couple of times, but there was no reason to check for a credit score because I wasn't planning on borrowing money. Uh, you're going to hear over and over the mantra is you need to have a good credit score or you need to have a great credit score. You don't unless you're going to borrow money. Well, we Since hear this stopped... from personal finance experts all the time. I mean, yeah. to the point where they're saying for your children, you have to <laughs> open up a credit card and start paying a bill so that they can establish a good credit. Yeah. And it's, it's, 
It's true if you want to build credit. It's true if you want to uh, borrow money. Although there are alternative ways, it's just harder to do. In the old days, we used to do, have to do something called manual underwriting to get a mortgage without a credit score. But because the credit score is so not just prevalent, but easy and cost efficient for the banks. And I don't fault the banks for using credit scores to evaluate people for getting loans. I don't fault them for that. Uh, it's an efficient cost. It's a cost efficient way very easy for them to do. However, if you only use that as your evaluation, then it's biased. It's prejudiced against people like me who have no debt products. They have no credit report. It's as if we didn't exist or we just got out of high school. You know, what am I supposed to do if I want to go out and buy a house? Well, I should have the money for a house, but of course the house is really expensive, especially these days. So what do you do? Well, there's alternatives out there. There's a company that I promote. It's called eCredible. I am an affiliate of theirs. Great service. Now they will uh, report things to the credit bureaus now so that you end up do having a credit score. But now I could have no debt, no credit cards, no loans of any kind, have a completely clear credit report, but then I'm showing that I've got a good payment history through something like eCredible, which is really interesting to me. So I'm credit worthy without having a credit score. Yeah, this idea, I think it's something that most of us don't think about, the idea of credit score versus credit worthiness. Yeah. And a credit score is based only on debt products or things that you didn't pay. And of course, I'm not going to recommend that you don't pay things to have a credit score. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. Uh, you should pay your bills and your your debts if you have them on time. But if you don't have any debts, then there's nothing for the credit report to be pulled on. So if you've got a clear credit report, you should be credit worthy. It's just going to take a bank more work or this third party type services to be able to verify that, yeah, this person isn't just a ghost, isn't just living off the grid. They actually could be uh, credit worthy for a mortgage. When you cut up the credit cards, was that the same, the same cards that your wife was using? Did she do the same at the same time? Uh, gosh, we're talking 16 years ago now, was it? Uh, she kept one card, I think, for a long time. Because she, was, she wasn't convinced like I was. She kept that thing for a while. And I was like, that's a... St I, I call it a stupid credit card. And I shouldn't use that, that term in my household. But I, I just like that stupid credit card. Uh, so I wasn't going to push it on her. Just like I'm not going to push it on anybody else. The belief system was mine. Uh, I've already given my reasons why I won't use credit cards. So... She chose to to keep it for a while, and and that's her prerogative. Have you met many other people who do not have a credit score? Yeah, I'll bump into them once in a while, especially on social media these days, just because I'll I'll be looking around and yeah, I haven't had a credit score in three years or something like that. Uh, you have to wonder how they're getting around if they're not using credit, if they're not using credit cards, and well, like I mentioned before, we can buy things with debit. Uh, I buy stuff all the time with our debit cards or I'll do a bank draft occasionally for something. Most of the time it's a debit card, uh, cash or check. I still use a check maybe once a month, I think for things, but it's just random stuff once in a while. Um, yeah, paper checks. I got to get away from those, but, <laughs> but nowadays you can even have your bank send a payment to somebody else through their bill pay system. It's pretty cool that the systems are all there. The mantra that you can't live without a credit card, or that you know if, if your credit if your if your credit card is compromised, you don't lose any money. But if your debit card is, you would. That's not true anymore. It's just a mantra that's stuck around for a decade longer than it should have. Debit cards and credit cards have the same protections. If they got that Visa Mastercard logo on it, uh, we can look it up online. The zero liability policies are there. I've had it happen to us in this household where. We've had three debit cards compromised and in each situation, uh, well, two of the three situations, the bank called us, Hey, somebody just rented a, uh, a, a room in a hotel in Vegas. Was that you? I'm like, no, I'm in Missouri. Uh, that wasn't me. Charges were reversed, signed a form, sent it in done. Money was taken, uh, put right back in the account. Uh, however, I have a family member who had a credit card that was compromised. They called the credit card company and the credit card company wouldn't stand behind their zero liability policy. They said, you have to call that, that whoever it is that's, you know, taking this money out of your account and deal with them. What? So, oh, I was furious when I heard that story. It's like, that's ridiculous. So there's really, 
a lot of repeating and echo chamber mantras about credit cards, the benefits of credit cards that just need to be dispelled. And, and hopefully the people listening to this will understand a little bit more about this crazy guy who's, you know, contrary to, you know, the culture's belief that you got to have a credit card to live in the United States. You don't, you can buy stuff with money. Yeah, that's pretty crazy because I, I've heard Frank Abagnale, you know, he, it, it was the movie Catch Me If You Can, that, that it was about his life. You know, he was the con man. And today, I think he, he was working for the FBI once he was caught. And he's talked about credit card versus debit card. And uh, from his presentations, my takeaway was that with the credit card, the credit card companies bear more liability. Like it, mm -hmm. that's why the security should be better because they're trying to look out for themselves versus the debit card that's your cash and a little bit more responsibility falls on you as, as far as like discovering that there's a problem and reporting it. It sounds, it sounded to me like with a debit card, you need to be a little bit more on top of it because that's your money versus the credit card. That's the bank's money. But I don't you know haven't if I seen that in reality. Yeah. I don't know if I completely agree with all that, but I could say that if you are if you're like me and you decide no more credit cards, you're going to pay more attention to your bank balance, to balancing your checkbook or your bank account, uh, to the transactions that occurred in your account, which are mostly coming from debit or cash withdrawals from ATMs. And as long as you're using, uh, as long as you're not using your pin number on your debit card, you have the same protections as credit. But by not having credit cards, I I'm forced to, pay more attention to the transactions in our bank account, which I think, Andrew, you would agree with me is something we all should be doing anyway. This isn't anything new. Watch your transactions, balance your checkbook on a regular basis, make sure there's no fraudulent activity. And when I do come across one, then I did have one. It was a December of, I want to say 2013. I don't know why it was 2013 in my mind. December, 2013, there's this $55 charge for gas or at a, at a, at a gas station uh, and I'm like, I don't know what this is. So I called our bank and said, hey, what is this thing? Oh, it was a, a, a charge for gasoline at a gas station at like 12, 15 in the morning on a Saturday, uh, 15 miles away from our house for diesel. I, I actually called the, the gas station after we found out the more information. Hey, what's this transaction? Do you have any, you know, did you see the guy on the camera, all that stuff? And they could at least give me the information. It was diesel gas. We don't have diesel vehicles in this, this house. And back then we wouldn't need $55 worth of gasoline because I was paying attention to our bank account because I could see the transaction. And this was probably two weeks after it happened. Um, no, one week, excuse me, right around Christmas time, by the way, it's not fun getting your cards replaced at Christmas time, but you got to have a buffer as well. Uh, savings account, you know, buffer we were able to take care of it just, just as quick as if it was a credit card company. And we did have our banks call us say, Hey, somebody charged this Vegas uh, room on your debit card and get it reversed right away. So they are looking out for it because it's really the same algorithms uh, and the banks are the banks. They're going to see all this stuff. And just because a debit card transaction might be processed slightly different than a credit card transaction, it's all still the same behaviors, the same spending processes. At risk of sounding like a rain man of credit card statements, I remember getting really mad at my credit card company in 1998 <laughs> because there was a gas charge from Germany. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? And I called them up and I said, I was not in Germany. This is not me. And they said, okay, well, just fill out this form and send it to us. I sent it in. Two weeks later... They rejected my, like, contesting of the thing. I'm like, I told you guys I was not in Germany. I'm like, you guys are wasting my time. I was so angry. Uh, 24 <laughs> years ago, you're still angry about it. You're still angry about it. I closed it. that card and, and then I put it behind me. This is the first time that I've mentioned it since then. <laughs> I think the technology has advanced since then. So hopefully you never have to deal with that type of thing again. Correct. Correct. So... <laughs> So, <laughs> so Steve, are there downsides to not having a credit card, not having a credit score? Like when it comes to getting insurance or traveling, right? We hear all these things. So 
I want to hear from you since you're living it. Okay. Uh, the downsides would be obviously anybody who is requiring a credit score, that's, that's going to be a, a roadblock there. You're going to have to get around that somehow. And there's ways to get around it all. So if you say something like my, my daughter is going to be moving out of the house soon, you know, how she get an apartment? Well, she's going to want to find somebody who'll look at her and all the information we could provide rather than a credit score. Uh, if you're going to go and rent a car, if you rent them at the airports, they're much more lenient, especially if you show some kind of return flight. So I've had that issue where I rented cars before with my debit card and then at a different place for whatever reason, off site, they wouldn't rent me a car. I'm like, okay. So you have to be, look at the, uh, the actual locations, uh, policies and check with them first. If you're going to rent a car out of state. Uh, the last thing is a mortgage. That's the one that concerns most people. Oh my gosh, got to have a great credit score. Got to do all these things, get a good credit score when I buy a house. Well, you don't buy a house very often and you can rebuild that credit score if you had to within six to eight months, probably pretty quickly. But I'm going to recommend that you don't because then now you're back in credit card, credit score, hell. <laughs> and, and, you know, for me, I've been building this life of cat of cash only track, you know, try cash only type transactions. Uh, for years, I've got no credit score. Um, I'm not going to go back into debt for a mortgage. We might have a mortgage in the future. Uh, we're actually planning on moving to a location that the house is probably going to cost a lot more than we expected. And we're not going to have all the funds, so we're going to have to take out a mortgage. How do we do that? We use those third-party type verification services. Or we require the bank go through some manual underwriting processes. And there are banks out there that offer that as their I'd say their specialty service, or at least one that they'll promote. The problem is with those types of services, it takes longer. It takes longer to gather the information, verify the information, uh, to do a manual underwriting process. So you got to be aware of that. One thing you don't want to do though is rush into buying a house. We saw what happened last year with people buying houses, you know, sight unseen, no inspections. There were some issues that didn't didn't get covered when they were buying the house. So it forces you to pay attention more to everything and it forces you to be a little patient with the processes when it takes longer like a mortgage. Do you have to be more selective about the companies that you do business with, like the rental car company, or if you're going to be applying for a mortgage, are there certain banks that are easier to work with versus others? Well, I haven't taken out a new mortgage in a year, so I couldn't say if there are one bank is, is more than the other. Uh, as far as like renting cars, I don't have a list of, of, uh, rental car companies that do better than others when it comes to renting debit with debit. But I'll tell you the ones that, uh, didn't, of course I won't name them here, but, uh, I stay away from the ones who, who caused me problems, who wouldn't let me, I just, I, there's plenty of rental car companies out there. I'm not picky about what I get. I'm not picky about you know, as I'm not as picky about how much they're charging me, of course, within reason. So I'll stay away from the ones that screwed me in the past. I'm just not going to deal with them. And that's just their problem. They, they lost their business to me because for some reason they had to have some kind of credit score, even though I could be completely, I could buy the car if I wanted to. We actually have the cash to buy a new car in a, in a, a state if I wanted to, but why would you do that if you're staying for three days? So, yeah. I get the sense that you and your wife, besides being you know, credit score free, credit card free, you're very good with your household budgeting. Mm -hmm. So can you share some tips with us? Like, how do you do it so that you can do it consistently and keep doing it over time? Keep it up. We have a expectation. I think we said it once and we just stuck to it that at the end of every calendar month, we sit down and we go through the budget. Now we used to use a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. And boy, I'll tell you what, in the old days, you use a spreadsheet, you had to get your laptop out and you had to share it. And you know, that's not as fun. Now we use YNAB and we can just actually project it onto our television screen if we wanted to, or look at, look at it on our phones. The technology has made it really easy to do that. So we can just do a quick review during the month or a big review once a month, say, here's what we're expecting. We, we grab our calendars, you know, whose birthdays are coming up. Do I have to buy gifts for that? Is it Christmas? Is it Thanksgiving, are we going on vacation, uh, whatever, what kind of unusual expenses are we looking forward to this month? And that once a month meeting pretty much takes care of it. It doesn't take a lot of time. 
Uh, I'll tell you another uh, Joe Salcihai from Stacking Benjamins. He tells this story all the time. He and his wife get together once a week. I th- believe it's on a Sunday and they try to make it a little fun. So they'll have a budget meeting every Sunday and it'll either be over pancakes or a glass of wine. So they're always getting together and breaking bread with people is always a fun thing to do. And having a meal with family members just as fun as long as you're not arguing about stuff. If you're looking at your money once a week, there's no surprises there. And if there are, you should have been talking about it before, you know, before you get together on Sunday. Oh, by the way, uh, I forgot to make the the car payment last week or something like, you know, (laughs) so once a week meetings usually takes care of it in no time. Plus they, they got to have wine or pancakes or if I know Joe, he might have had both. <laughs> <laughs> what I liked about Joe's was that I think he keeps it to 15 minutes or mm-hmm. he says that he does, which just feels very doable. Uh, but he also said that just keeping to a 15 minute weekly meeting, inevitably you're talking and paying attention to your finances more throughout the week. So there was a benefit. Yeah. And I don't think it's exactly about just the money stuff. Other discussions come out of that. We talk about our upcoming trips. We're talking about, you know, where we want to go or, or we end up, my, so my wife and I are looking at moving to a different location. You know, we keep talking about this house that we're dreaming about. So those are fun discussions. You know, it's not a bad thing to talk about it before you move there. Cause then you know what you're looking for. So Steve, this like countercultural, unconventional sort of uh, piece of you, When you meet people and you tell them that you're a full-time podcast editor, do most people realize that that's a thing? (laughs) I didn't believe it was a thing until I started doing it. I still kind of can't believe it's a thing. It's obviously a specialized field, but if you look at all the things that we have available to us these days, there's a specialty out there. We can't automate everything, and there's a lot of good reasons to hire coaches or to get training or just to go out and buy the thing that's going to help you to do it. There's services out there and products that I, I look at the dollar store, look at the dollar store and all the crap they have in there. <laughs> who made that? Who came up with that? So people are coming up with ideas and they're selling them. And, and there's something to be said about America where you could make anything and sell anything. So we were talking about the side hustles earlier. I mean, that could be something that could come out of somebody's invention. Great. But, as a podcast editor, I mean, who thought that you could make money editing audio for other people who put it out there for free? Long business model ideas we can talk about here, but uh, it, it's turned out to be a really cool career. I love it. And I also lead a community for podcast editors now, which is a lot of fun being looked at as kind of like a leader in the space and being able to help other people do the same thing as me and have that uh, I've been blessed. I get to work out of the house all the time. If I want, I get to, um, make my own schedule. I don't have to take on a client if I don't want to. So there's a lot of great benefits to that type of thing. So I don't know what your question was. I don't remember if I <laughs> addressed it at all, but, uh, I'll let you ask it again. If I didn't, here's my question. How long did it take you with this side hustle of editing other people's podcasts? to start making more than you were as an auditor? I did a a evaluation back in 2018 or 2019 to see, okay, am I making more money than the old salary job? And it's true. It takes about three years for things to become successful. I've seen that over and over again. For me, that was also the case. I started editing for somebody else, for another person, for money in early 2016. And six months later, it became a full-time job. I had so much demand people, other, other people coming to me. So it was a needed service that I didn't know was out there and people thought I could do it. Somehow I had him fooled, but, (laughs) but it became a career and, and I was making less though than the old salary job because I didn't think it was a real thing. I didn't think I could do it. My rates were really low because I was like, well, I'll do it. It's fun. So why should I charge for fun? Right. And then I started raising my rates. And what's interesting is that in 2017, I actually made a little bit less than I did in 2016. Even though I had more experience, more gigs, higher rates, I still made a little bit less. And then in 2018, it just kind of shot up because then I started figuring it out. I had some contractors. I was able to outsource more work too. So I was able to take on more clients, raising rates, becoming more efficient with things. And it, it was that third year I finally broke through and actually made more 
than the old salary job that I had left in 2015. So three years is somehow a magic number that keeps coming up about success stories. And it was true for me as well. Well, it's great to see you doing work that you truly love and something that. that is a passion and that you just, I feel like you would just be giving so much of it away if this were not what you did for your occupation. But the fact that you can monetize it and do better than you were in your full-time job working for a corporation, is just, um, that's the dream. Yeah. And even though I charge for my services, I still give a lot away. It's still ingrained in me to just give, give, give. I, I run a community for my peers in the space. Even if I don't work for them directly, I run a community for them. Of uh, always looking for ways to spread information and help, even if it's free, just because it's going to elevate the community of uh, the podcasting space, I should say, uh, which I really want to see become an even bigger uh, medium for people who use their cell phones, you know, their smartphones and listen to audio. Uh, it's great to learn stuff on podcasts and they, they can be entertaining too. Steve, I like to ask all the inspired money guests, how do you define success? How do I define success? Having no worries. Having no worries. You can be concerned about things, but having no worries. I mean, think about the word worry. You're sitting there and you're wondering about something that may or may not exist. You're, you're concerned. If you're concerned, that makes sense because you're concerned about facts. But if you're worried, I see my wife do this all the time. She worries about stuff. And I'm like, don't worry. You can be concerned, but don't worry because nothing comes from it. You're wasting your time. So with the, the 15 plus years now that we've been paying attention to our money, with the six plus years of having absolutely no debt and investing and saving for the future, we pay cash for our daughter's college. She's going to graduate next year. What is there to worry about? Everything's paid for. Nobody can come here and, and take anything from us unless they're stealing. You know, I'm not going to get anything repossessed because I forgot to make a payment. It's all paid for. So there's no worries in this household. And it's just been, it's been wonderful. So I would call that a measurement of, of success. No worries. Last question for you. We talked a lot about debt and the importance of how your values, how you apply that to your debt. Do you also apply, like, how do your values, how does that get applied to your investments? Are you talking about like social responsible investing and things like that? Yeah. Have not really concerned myself with that. Do you look through that? a lens at all in that No, line? because I've learned that unless you're buying a stock directly from a company, you really don't, uh, you don't have much impact that way, at least not a measurable one. I would much rather if... If I can remain solvent, if I can remain liquid and have assets and grow wealth, I can do some pretty good things with the money that we've earned. Trying to find my way through specific investments, I'd be spending a lot more time on it than I think I need to, to try and figure out well, which ones you know support the, uh, I'm trying to, I don't want to go with the really big one. We'll say the cigarette company. Uh, I think we can all agree cigarettes are not good for people. So if I tried to find those mutual funds that didn't have any investment in Philip Morris, I think it is, whatever, I'd be spending an inordinate amount of time doing research there. So I'm going to concern myself more on when I have myself, my household situated, what can we do to make sure that we're helping other people as well. We've got, obviously got some charitable giving that we do in this house. My wife's going to start volunteering. She quit her job in September. No worries. Uh, so now she's going to go volunteer at a dog shelter. I mean, how cool is that? She doesn't have to go back to work. I love it. I, I think that it's so great thank, that you shared your story with us and your perspectives on how you can align your values with your money and the things that you do. Uh, tell the Inspired Money listeners and viewers where they can follow you and get more. Well, if they want to follow me, uh, Twitter, I'm Steve Stewart, M-E. It's Steve Stewart, M-E. Uh, Stewart is S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Uh, and I just use M-E because I couldn't get stevestewart.com as a website because the guy has owned it since 1997. So I'm not going to get that anytime soon. So I went for a .me domain. So I just made everything Steve Stewart me. 
Uh, you can find me there and uh, I'm trying to get into Instagram, but I just don't post pictures. And since I work out of my house, there's not a whole lot of here, you know, stuff here to share that's interesting. So <laughs> try me there, but uh, that's, that's kind of where you find me unless you are into the podcast post-production stuff. And then I've got a Facebook community. Just go to podcasteditorsclub.com and you find it there. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Pay attention, not interest. I like Steve's motto. Take the time to pay attention to your money. I promise that you'll be better for it. The way Steve avoids credit and borrowing provides us with a couple great lessons. First, even if you're not willing to cut up your credit cards, it pays to be patient. Buy things that you need, be thoughtful about your purchases, especially plan for the big ones even if that doesn't mean having it right now. Second, it's okay to do what feels right to you. Don't worry about what other people do or what other people think. Live by your own values. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please post a comment below. Thanks for watching to the end. I wanna invite you to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Running Meet Investment Team highlights data, news, and events that we think are worth sharing. Subscribe at inspiredmoney.fm newsletter. It's free and informative. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.